Hi, good morning everybody and thank you so much for joining us for our latest webinar. Uh, today's web uh, today today's two webinars mark the start of our marking of uh, Autism Awareness Month. We'll be hearing some lived experience and some voices uh, which I know that everyone finds of great interest and there will also be a chance for Q&A's as normal. So I'd like to introduce Claire Duggan who is our Regional Director for Strategy and Transformation and has within her portfolio mental health, uh, learning disabilities and autism delivery. So Claire, over to you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for, for joining today. Um, could you just pop to the next slide, please, Ivo? Thank you. Uh, so today what we would like to talk about is autism and people with autism, um, which is obviously quite a spectrum, um, which is a development uh, in, in relation to the, the disability that, uh, of how people may have developed. It's it's not always easy to diagnose and I think that does cause a problem sometimes with people and some people may have been diagnosed in, ch in childhood but for others it may be much later. And obviously it does vary how people have presentations. It could be mild and people just live independent lives but for some it may have severe uh, disabilities requiring continued support and care. Um, and today we, uh, we were planning to, to launch our autism event. Uh, you may have seen the, um, the number of events that are coming up. So today we've got What is Autism? And Kirsty Meehan is joining us. Kirsty is a specialist speech and language therapist and she's going to help us understand more about autism, how people with autism experience the world and, and maybe how we could help to change attitudes. Um, you know, what could we do to be better allies, how we think about our behaviour and how we embrace autism. And so you will see we have a number of other events uh, throughout the month. So on the 7th of April, we have what does it mean to be a, an, you know, an autistic person for lived experience. At 13th of April, how do we gain a greater understanding of autism and our health or social care workforce? For February the 23rd, uh, fri Friday the 23rd, sorry, um, autism awareness, what does good look like? And then finally a closing panel on the 29th of April, because what we want to be looking at is um, from these events, what questions have been asked? Have we been able to answer all the questions? Are there still some questions that we still need to do? What, what have we gained? What have we learned? What does good look like? And as I mentioned earlier, how we become better allies, how we think about our behaviour and how we can really you know, um, embrace and support people with autism. Um, we'll also be recording the events and Anthony will explain you know, they will be uploaded so that in future you might be able to signpost people to something that may help them. Um, obviously, as I've mentioned, uh, Today is the um, Autism Awareness Month launch, but there was also this follows on from the World Autism Awareness Day on the 2nd of April, which was to celebrate and raise awareness and acceptance of autism. Um, one of the challenges I think that many of us have seen is the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic, and that's been very tough for people with, with autism and their families, with some services not being available, people may have felt isolated and alone, and we've also seen the impact um, if people have actually contracted COVID. And there's a lot that we have learned from that. And we want to ensure that learning is, is embedded. We've also continued to implement the long term plan. And you will have seen within that long term plan, it's about improving community based services, developing and clearer needs on the need, uh, clear, clear focus on the needs of autistic people and their families, provide good quality care healthcare and treatment and we really would like to prioritise um, as, as, as we go through this year now um, the annual health checks they are they can be they have been challenged in the past but we really hope that we can really strengthen those because we want to reduce health inequalities and that would really help with that but also from the learnings from the past year will help to will help to reduce those health inequalities as well um, and obviously through the long term plan we want to champion uh, the insight and strengths of those who have lived experiences and their families which we can learn from from some of our events through this month and then finally bring a full circle of awareness of the needs of those with autism. 
So I'm going to, to pause there and I'm going to hand over to Kirsty Meehan, who has kindly agreed to join us today and will help and will give a bit more of an understanding of what autism is. Um, we've obviously got the, the chat box, so please feel free to, um, add, to pop questions in the chat box and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. So I hope you enjoy the session. We'd really welcome your feedback because that's how we can all sort of learn. That would be the best thing. But um, anyway, let's see what, how the day brings and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. So thank you, Kirsty. Thanks, Claire. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, um, I'll, I'll wait for my presentation to come up on the screen. Um, so I'll introduce myself while we're waiting. My name's Kirsty, and I'm a speech and language therapist. I've been working with autistic people since I graduated from university. I started off in education and then I moved into adult services. I've worked in community learning disability teams and inpatient services. And now I work for the Greater Manchester Specialist Support Team and we work with people with autism who are having difficulties with their mental health or are involved with um, the criminal justice system. So I've got you for the next half an hour and I'm really excited to be kicking off um, with the talks. And in this session, we're going to cover what autism is and how it presents, um, the difference between autism, learning disability and learning difficulty. Um, we'll look at some statistics and a bit of an introduction into autism in women, which is something I'm particularly interested in. So I thought we could start off by just warming up the chat box a little bit. Um, so if you can find that, um, there should be a speech bubble somewhere on your screen so you can open it and just zero to five, just put a number in the box, um, zero being I know nothing about autism, I'm here starting from scratch, five being, you know, I'm pretty confident, know a lot about autism, you know, where are you guys up to? Let's get to know each other a little bit. Thank you, Claire, starting us off. Can only see Claire so far. Have I? Can I see a different, a different chat? So I think Kirsty, because we're in Teams Live, so mm -hmm. we have a slight delay on the chat so that we can right. just observe and monitor before we publish. So it will uh -huh. just take a few minutes longer. So if you wanted to keep talking, I can update you when stuff starts to appear. Lovely. Well, the other thing I was going to ask, as well as your confidence out of five, maybe just one or two words about who you are. So are you a person with autism? Are you a professional? Are you a parent of somebody with autism? Um, just so that we can kind of start getting used to putting things in the chat and we can get to know each other a little better. So if that's if that's all right with you, Anthony. Um, yeah, absolutely some fine. So we've got some we've got some uh, feedback arriving. So we have twos, we have two to three, we have zero. And this was in terms of your question about autism yeah. awareness. Um, we have uh, three, we have one, three, two, three. Um, so we have 35 people in the uh, room with us. And so we're hovering between two and three. I'd say three is probably the most popular. There are a couple of zeros. Probably two to three might give an indication of starting point there, Kirsty. That's great. And I think that'll work really well for what we've got planned for today. Um, so if I could go to the next slide, please. I feel like I'm having flashbacks to the COVID. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but when somebody asks me what is autism, it kind of makes me clam up a little bit because it's so difficult to summarise in like a sound bite, something so complex and varied. But I think the National Autistic Society has done a really good job. So they say that autism is a lifelong developmental disability that affects how a person communicates and relates to other people and how they experience the world around them. And that's a really big statement, but I'm hoping in the next half an hour we're going to unpack that a little bit and think about what that actually means for people with autism. So next slide. So currently, in all the diagnoses that you can be given are all in a book and it's called the ICD and the current version that we're using is going to get updated in January 22 and there's going to be some slight changes in how autism is described in that book. So currently, when we talk about autism, we call it a triad of impairments and that is difficulties with communication, difficulties with social interaction and restrictive and repetitive activities and interests. When we move over to the new version in January, it's 
it's pretty similar really they combined difficulties with interaction and social communication into one and i kind of agree with that because i don't really know how you can separate those two things out and then we're keeping the restricted interests and repetitive behaviors but there is one big change between now and january 20 2022 so currently under the autism header we have three subtypes childhood autism, Asperger's syndrome, and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, which is a bit of a mouthful, so you sometimes hear it called PDD. What's gonna happen in January 2022 is that we're gonna lose the label Asperger's disorder and the other general developmental disorders, and it's all gonna be classified under one label, which is autism spectrum disorder. So if we could go to the next slide, I'm gonna explain a little bit about why that decision has been made. So the history of Asperger syndrome is that in 1944, Hans Asperger in Germany found that there was a pattern for young boys who um, were presenting difficulties with social skills and repetitive and restricted interests, but they had above average intelligence and language skills. And in 1994, that was formally recognised in America's version of the ICD, which is called the DSM. When they did a new version of that document in 2013, they removed Asperger syndrome and replaced it with autism spectrum disorder. And that's why in the UK and Europe, we're going to follow the same um, process. And the reason they did that is that the, the different terms under the umbrella of autism were being used in a lot of different ways. And so there was inconsistency about how different presentations were being labeled. And because the population of people with autism is so diverse, it was just too complex to be kind of dividing the group up into under these labels. But actually, you know, the term Asperger syndrome is very much part of the public consciousness around autism. And a lot of people have found it quite difficult to understand why we're letting go of this label. Um, it's still going to be widely used. And there's a lot of people who've been given Asperger's diagnoses in the past that feel very strongly that that's part of their identity. It's the community that they belong to and they don't want to let go of that term. So even though it's really important for us to speak accurately when we're talking and writing clinically, we also need to take into account the person's personal preferences about how they identify with their autism. So if we go on to the next slide, These terms are um, sometimes almost used interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. So we're going to break down a little bit what the different words mean. So on the next slide. You might need to click through, just fill the slide up and I'll talk through it. Yeah, once more. There we go. So the thing that unites these three labels, autism, learning disability and learning difficulty, is that all three of them are a lifelong condition and they all affect people's day to day life. The difference with autism is that it's diagnosed through characteristics that the person presents with. On the next slide, there's a bit more of an explanation about learning disability. So. Learning disability is usually defined as somebody having an IQ score, so a measure of intelligence of below 70. But we would also take into account how the person manages in their day to day life and things like their communication, their organisation skills, how much support they need. And it might be categorised as mild, moderate, severe or profound and multiple learning disability, depending on how severe that person's learning disability is. And it's more common for people with autism to have a learning disability. 60 to 70 percent of people with autism also have a learning disability, but there's still a huge proportion of the autistic population that don't have a learning disability. So they've got typical or above average intelligence. The next slide is about learning difficulty. So a learning difficulty is um, something that affects a very specific aspect of learning or thinking for that person and otherwise their abilities are within the typical range that we would expect for the rest of the population. So there's just some examples on the screen here, and these are things that you will have heard of people having. So if somebody's got a specific difficulty with attention, they might get a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Or if they've got problems with reading and writing, they might get a dyslexia diagnosis. So people with autism are also more likely to have a learning difficulty as well 
compared to the rest of the population. But you can only have a learning difficulty if the rest of your development is within the typical range that, as we expect. So if somebody's got general difficulties across a lot of areas, they might be more likely to get a diagnosis of a learning disability. So on the next slide, um, I just thought it might be useful to talk about some statistics. So um, the number of people with autism in the UK is about 700,000, which equals one in 100 people have autism. And that number is based on the number of children being diagnosed now, because we're much more effective now at diagnosing than we used to be in the past. We've still got quite a big gender discrepancy. So this as the gap has shrunk significantly, um, but we still only have one female being diagnosed every three males diagnosed. 80% of people with autism will struggle with their mental health at some point in their life. And there's really good evidence that actually a lot of those people's needs aren't being met by services at the moment. And we also have some problems with getting people with autism in employment. So only 22% of people with autism are in any paid employment. That's compared to 80% of the general population and 50% for the rest of the population with disabilities. So we can see that there are still huge disadvantages for people with autism in accessing services. And on the next slide, we do have some laws that protect people with autism. So one of them is the Equality Act, and that was passed in 2020, 2010, and it recognised autism as a disability and therefore protects against discrimination from anyone like employers, businesses, organisations that include shops and um, health services. So they must legally make reasonable adjustments to meet the needs of people with disabilities, which includes people with autism. So those reasonable adjustments might be something like having a longer time to have your appointment. It might be making some adjustments around the person's sensory needs or their communication needs. So that's a really powerful thing that people with autism can use to protect them if they do feel that they're being discriminated against. On the next slide, we've got a bit of an explanation of the Autism Act. So the National Autistic Society campaigned for the Autism Act and it was passed in 2009 and it was the first ever disability specific legislation to be passed in the UK. It was a real landmark event and it led to the development of the Autism Strategy, which was the government's plan for how services should be improved. And there was legally binding guidance for local councils, so they had to follow the advice. And even though we've come a really long way in the past 10 years or so, based on the statistics that I've just given you, there are still huge gaps in services that we need to address. And I think events like this are a really important part of making that progress towards that. So if we move on. So what we talk about is autism being a spectrum, but a lot of the time, what does that really mean? You know, it's something that kind of gets banded about. And we used to think about autism as being really more of a scale than a spectrum. So on one end, um, there was people with autism who had additional learning disability, had more severe impairment and had greater support needs. And then on the other end, we talked about people who had average or above average intelligence and were maybe functioning at a very high level in some areas, but experiencing difficulties in others. But actually, this wasn't really very helpful because it didn't represent the huge diversity that we see in the autistic population. So now we think about it a little bit more like this on the next slide. So what we can see here in this kind of pie chart is different areas that are associated with autism. So um, a lot of people with autism have specific interests, a need for routine and predictability. They may have a different thinking style. And the reason we use this is because any individual with autism may have more or less of some of these particular factors as part of their autism. So it really allows us to have um, a much more sensitive way of talking about how a person's autism affects them compared to just whether they are more able or less able, which isn't very helpful at all. So what we can do now is break down these labels a little bit and talk about how each one might affect a person with autism. So on the next slide, one of the things we talk about a lot for people with autism is that they might have specific interests and maybe some obsessiveness, repetition and collecting. So what we quite often see is that somebody with autism might have a deep interest in one or a very small number of topics and they might spend a lot of their time and their energy on focused activities associated with that interest. Sometimes we see that it's based around particular routines. 
or organising and systemising in a particular way. It might be important for that person to collect or to maybe complete a set associated with that interest. And a lot of the time it's a really positive part of their life. It's an important part of their identity and it's a way for them to deal with the world and a big part of how they manage their emotional well-being. And what we see is that it can lead to really highly developed knowledge and skills in particular areas for some individuals. But we do sometimes see challenges if the balance between that interest and other aspects of health and well-being aren't fully in line. So sometimes people with autism express that they find it difficult to find that balance. The next slide is about routine and predictability and thinking style. So what autistic people often describe is being more reliant on routines and finding changes in their routines or unpredictable situations quite stressful. And that can mean that they're really suited to thinking systematically and they might enjoy working with processes that are predictable and consistent. And it means that often people with autism excel in scientific pursuits, maybe mathematics or computing, things like that. Next slide. One of the things that people with autism often talk about is having difficulties with communication. And this is because human communication is incredibly complex and often unpredictable. Um, so we can break communication down into kind of two areas that a person with autism might struggle with. So one of them is language. So when we talk about language, it's about understanding what people are saying to you, getting your message across using words. And this can be difficult for people with autism if they struggle with vocabulary. So one of the things about words is that they often carry multiple meanings and that inconsistency can be difficult for the person with autism to understand and process. They might also have some difficulties with attention and memory, which can relate to some of the other issues that they might have around sensory needs or maybe additional difficulties like ADHD. On the other side of communication, we've got social communication skills. So when we talk about social communication skills, we're talking about how people interpret things like body language, facial expression, tone of voice and thinking about the whole social environment that we're in a lot of the time. In social situations, there are unspoken social rules that we don't ever really tell each other about, but we pick it up as we go along. And people with autism sometimes describe feeling like they need to learn those things in a way that the rest of the population just seem to pick it up as they go along. And a big part of social communication is making predictions about the thoughts and the feelings of the other people around you and how they might behave or what their plan might be. And that's often something that people with autism might find difficult. On the next slide, I think this is a really interesting one because we talk about imagination, but quite often when we're thinking about imagination, we put it in the box of maybe make believe play or creating a new story to tell somebody and that that's when we use our imagination. But we're actually using our imagination all day for loads of different things. So an example might be making a plan. When we make a plan, we think about the future, we imagine the situation we might be in, the different possibilities and what we might do in those situations. And that's something that we really need our imagination for. Also predicting consequences is something that we need to imagine the possible different things that could happen. And it's going to be, that's going to be a difficult thing to do if you struggle with your imagination. Even something like interpreting a map, so taking something that's 2D and putting it into our 3D world and thinking about how that relates to the real world is something we need to use our imagination for. And coming up with solutions to problems, um, considering other people's perspectives. So what is that person thinking and feeling? What their, might their motivations be? What might their intentions be? Are they being truthful with me or are they actually trying to manipulate me? All these things require our imagination. Even engaging with a fictional story. So if we enjoy soaps or films or reading a book, we're able to use our imagination to invest in the story whilst also holding in our mind that this isn't real and that there is a disconnection between that and our lives. And that's something we use our imagination for. And even when we're thinking about a situation we've been in in the past or we're telling somebody something that has happened to us, that is also us using our imagination to go through all the things that happened and what that person, the information that person needs to know to understand what we experienced. So visual imagination is something that a lot of people with autism experience differently from the rest of the population, and it can cause some differences in the way they do these different activities. 
Now, a lot of people with autism have really rich internal fantasy lives and really enjoy fictional storytelling like TV programmes and books and maybe even um, role playing games. But it's important that a lot of the time people with autism talk about experiencing that slightly different from the rest of us. And on the next slide, the other thing that we talk about a lot for people with autism is sensory differences. And this is something that's kind of really complex to talk about. And, we, you know, we, we could do a whole um, session specifically on this. But what you can see on this slide is the seven generally accepted senses that we talk about. Hearing, vision, smell, taste, touch, balance and body awareness. And a lot of the time when we talk about sensory differences, we're talking about hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity to these different sensory stimuli. And it's not that if we, you know, sometimes you hear it talk about simplistically that that person is hypersensitive or hyposensitive, but actually in any one individual, they might experience different things associated with each of these senses. So you might meet a person with autism who is very sensitive to some sounds, but also really enjoys listening to loud music other times. Um, so, you know, that's something that is really individual for people and it's important that we really understand their sensory needs when we're thinking about making reasonable adjustments and how to make situations more accessible for people with autism. So on the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit more about women. So we talked also a little bit earlier about how women um, are only diagnosed at a ratio of one to every three males. And there's different arguments and thoughts about why that might be. Some people say that um, women are just less likely to have autism. There are just fewer women with autism than there are men. But actually, there is a little bit more of a school of thought that maybe we're missing something when it comes to autism and women. So what we see um, in the population is that males and females with autism do tend to present slightly differently. And the criteria was developed based on how the males presented. So when we were talking before about Hans Asperger, he was talking about a pattern in boys. He wasn't talking about a pattern in children. You know, so we know that the boys and the girls with autism are presenting slightly differently from each other. And it could be that the criteria we're using to diagnose isn't as sensitive to the female presentation. Autistic women tend to mask their difficulties. This is something a lot of women talk about being kind of socially acceptable and learning what they have to do to get on in life without people noticing their difficulties. And it seems that women with autism may be slightly more able to do that than the boys. They're a lot less likely to present challenges to systems. So in education, girls with autism are more likely to um, withdraw and isolate themselves than present a more um, obvious challenge to, say, a classroom situation. And a lot of the time with um, women with autism, they're diagnosed later and before their autism diagnosis, they receive other diagnoses, usually mental health diagnoses like OCD, eating disorders and personality disorders before they get their autism diagnosis, which actually explains what their difficulties are relating to. And also there seems to be a bit of a pattern that the interests that women have associated with their autism are slightly more socially acceptable or not really noticed as a problem in the same way as the interests that males have. So there's a pattern for women with autism maybe being interested in things like soaps, art, um, music bands, that it's for some reason not noticed as a part of their autism presentation in the same way as the male's interests might be. So I thought it might be nice to include some um, experiences of women with autism. So on the next slide, we can see some quotes that I got off the National Autism Society website. So the top one is from Sarah Gibbs, who's a comedy writer, and she said that she thinks there's a lack of understanding about how autism presents in girls and they're often socialised differently. Um, and in and Charles Davis, who's a tattoo artist, said that she thinks that being a female, she's expected to behave a certain way to fit in, which is why she spent so much time masking. So that's related to um, this idea that actually the way we treat girls with autism and the way we treat boys with autism is slightly different. And maybe we celebrate the differences in boys a little bit more than we do with girls and we expect girls to be more to behave better and to fit in more and they learn to mask their difficulties as opposed to um, presenting with them more overtly. 
Camilla Pang, who's a scientist and author, says she thinks that autistic women are more likely to be described as anxious and their autism diagnosis is overlooked because it challenges gender stereotypes. So people don't expect a woman to have autism, so they don't consider it. And instead they give them a diagnosis related to mental health like anxiety. And Kate Fox, who is a poet and comedian, she said that she doesn't think there is an inherent difference between autistic men and women. But what the difference is, is how society treats and socialises males and females. So I think those are really interesting perspectives um, in this discussion about why have we got so many fewer girls being diagnosed with autism? And are we missing a population that really needs the support but isn't able to access it? So moving on. What we've got here is um, a slide of notable people with autism diagnoses and um, I'll just I'll just work my way through them. I'm sure you will recognise some of them at least. So on the top left is Anne Hegarty, which um, I think she's more commonly known as the governess on the chase. And she is um, a quiz champion. She is in the, the different competition she's won is just absolutely incredible. Um, and obviously now she's on the TV in a lot of different quiz programmes because of her unbelievable general knowledge. And next to her, we've got Chris Packham, who's the um, natural world expert, who is the presenter on a lot of the BBC Nature programmes like Spring Watch. And then the final person on the top right is Albert Einstein, who obviously was born and died long before autism was even something that we talked about. But posthumously, a lot of autistic, autism experts have said that they think that there's good enough evidence to say that he was a person who had autism. So the people on the top row are the type of people we might associate with autism. And it seems quite obvious to me that their autism has allowed them to excel in their particular fields. So for Chris Packham, that incredibly intense and deep knowledge of the natural world has allowed him to excel um, in um, being one of the most knowledgeable people about British wildlife. And it's, and it's made him very successful as a presenter. And Anne Hegarty has almost gone the other way and she has this encyclopedic general knowledge that I'm sure is related to um, incredible memory and recall that she can be so good at those quizzes. And for somebody like Einstein, he saw the world in a different way, which is just um, just goes to show how important it is that people with autism are given the opportunity to explore those interests and are listened to when they maybe see the world slightly differently to how we think it is. And then on the bottom row, on the um, bottom left, we've got Greta Thunberg, who obviously has really shot into um, public awareness in the past couple of years because of her incredible environmental work. And next to her, we've got um, Temple Grandin, who um, is also an activist, but she's also an animal behaviour specialist. And some of her work has really changed the way cattle are treated in America. And I think, you know, when it comes to, to Greta Thunberg, I think that um, absolute tenacity and the ability to keep giving the same message and to believe so strongly in something, um, I think can own, has to be attributed to the fact that she has autism and that she's able to do that and what an incredible impact she's had. And also for Temple Grandin, you know, her ability to empathise with animals and, and think about how they experience the world and how she's related that to her the way she experiences the world and the difference she's made is really powerful and I'd really recommend looking into reading some of her books to um, hear about how she experiences her autism. And then the bottom right is Anthony Hopkins and I actually didn't realise he had an autism diagnosis until relatively recently and I wanted to include him because I think we sometimes have a, a stereotype that people with autism are scientific and methodical and maybe not creative and artistic. Um, especially in our like acting where we think about how important it is to take another person's perspective and understand you know the social context of that person's behaviour. But actually what we often see with people with autism is because they maybe don't pick up on um, social communication in the same way as the rest of the population, they can become incredibly skilled at observing human behaviour and copying it. And I think that his autism has absolutely contributed to his career as an actor. And obviously these people, these are famous people, I wanted to put them here because you'd recognise them and see the value that they'd, that they'd offered to us. 
but actually every person with autism can contribute something incredible to the world and I think it's so important that we are able to make those adaptations that they need from us so that we can have them in our workplaces and make sure that they're accessing the services they need to live a good life because they can offer so much value to society. So that's the end of my talk. I really hope that everybody's taken something or maybe has learned one thing from today. Um, I've really enjoyed being here and I'm happy now to answer any questions anybody's got um, about the talk or about autism in general. I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Kirsty, thank, thank you so, thank much. so much. That was, that was really, really informative. informative. Thank you so much. So we have got some questions in the chat. Um, if you just let me scroll back up. So you asked at the beginning about what people's current understanding was. And as part of our um, kind of learning from each of these webinars, we asked people to do a little survey as part of the chat around their awareness before and their awareness after and what they've learned and what they'll go away and do differently as a result of what they've heard. So Evo is about to post that in the chat. We're doing something slightly different this time. We have before you Survey Monkey. We're using Menti this time. So if people could take a few minutes just to fill that in, it really helps us plan future sessions. In terms of questions, then we've got people just reflecting on their different experiences, their personal experiences of autism. So we've got somebody who is who is saying they have a staff member who identifies as having mild autism. Somebody else has. Um, a two year old grandson who's possibly on the spectrum. We're also um, hearing about um, how people are offering to want to find out more and be involved. So we have a, a doctor here in the northwest um, who has ADHD traits and he's interested in improving how both his own experience, but also how he works with others. And he's asking if there's anything he could get involved with. Is there anything that you can signpost people to that they can add some value to both for themselves and to others in this space? Well, I think a really um, a, a great thing for um, getting involved with autism is there are a number of charities um, that you could get involved with, like the National Autistic Society. You could maybe donate money or if you want to get involved in fundraising or maybe even buddying up with somebody with autism. There's a huge um, lack of social support for people with autism. There's a lot of studies showing that. So if you've got time in your week, um, you know it would be great to reach out to some of those organizations and, and offer that because um, social support especially at this time is huge. Thanks Kirsty. Lots of really good feedback about your presentation how helpful people found it and how good it was um, and, a, a, and a kind of a um, clarity question then so of the 22 percent uh, that you referenced in employment do we know what the ratio is between males and females? I don't know that actually. I don't think the study broke it down in that way. But one thing I would want to point out about that 22% is it's not 22% in full time educate in full time employment It's 22% in any kind of employment. So, you know, I think we often see that a lot of people with autism maybe have part time jobs or zero hour contracts in jobs um, as opposed to having the hours that they would like to have. Um, and that's usually because those workplaces aren't able to make the adaptations that they need to work the hours they would like to. Um, so, you know, that 22 percent, one in five in any kind of employment is, you know, it's a really shocking figure. Now, that's really helpful. Thanks. And I know we're going to be talking in future webinars over this month about reasonable adjustment. I was just reading this particular message that we have around someone who has a grandson who is possibly on the spectrum now. We've all lived through a pandemic, we've all worked differently, we've all worked from home, we've all spent more time together than we'd normally do. And actually that's really um, difficult um, and even more challenging where children have particular needs. Mm. Are there any kind of tips that you'd give about how um, that child could be supported, how the care, how the family could be supported, particularly in the way in, in the kind of the, the way that we're currently living? Absolutely, we've seen a real um, a real range of different responses for, from people with autism on how they've coped with the pandemic. Some of them have actually found it to be a really welcome break from the demands of daily life. 
that they had before and have really enjoyed the time to manage their own schedules and spend time on their own particular interests. But as you say, a lot of people with autism have really struggled um, because of the loss of that routine and the structure that they've had in their lives. And I think particularly young children who, you know, um, had school and um, activities in the evenings that were a really important part of their daily structure and their families that are now trying to build that structure in in the home environment is incredibly challenging and I think if there were any tips um, the first one I would say is be compassionate to yourself that this is an incredibly unusual situation and that everybody just needs to do what they need to do to get through it so absolutely no pressure um, to to fill the the gap that, that school that school was filling before because you just can't do it and what we see with a lot of people with autism is they're quite um, environmental specific so they might be able to do certain things in a school environment that they're not able to do at home because that's not where they do their work um, and mum isn't the person that shows me how to do this thing that's my teacher that does that so a lot of people with autism have really struggled with that shift and, and adapting to it. So the first thing I would say is you're doing great. <laughs> Secondly, um, a really big thing for people with autism particularly is structure and routine and especially for young children with autism who aren't necessarily able to put that in for themselves. Um, anything you can do to create consistency and predictability in their day is going to be huge and also reaching out to the services that um, that should be supporting you so health services charities um, to get some advice so you know if if that child is really struggling with being at home it might be related to some sensory needs that aren't being met they might need certain types of movement or um, objects that will help them to regulate their sensory needs and that's not something that we can offer in a kind of a general blanket statement what you need is to approach the services that can get those assessments done so that you can build those into their routine and help them to cope with those things um, we know that the services for people with autism are often incredibly stretched and can't offer everything that we need them to but especially for the people with autism in our lives. They may need our support to advocate for them and to fight that they should have access to those services um, and that they really need them for their own well-being and for the well-being of the families as well. Reaching out to um, support groups and things like that and getting tips from other parents can be massive. That's really helpful. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, a couple of other bits. So I mentioned we're going to be looking at reasonable adjustment in more detail moving forward. People are just asking what kind of what straight away, what are maybe, and I know it's a broad spectrum, we've talked about that, but very broadly speaking, what are the some of the principles, some of the top tips you might be able to give about making, about us being better allies with people with autism? And just on that, I've just noticed what I've said there. So I, I generally put people before condition, so people first. In my in my in my view people are asking why we use that language and why we use person first do you have a view on that yeah i do and i, I suspect that probably today i've used those interchangeably so i'll have said autistic people and autistic women and men and boys and girls and i will have also said person with autism and um there is some relevance to that language so um in the fairly recent past person first language was considered to be the most appropriate um, way to talk about people, not just people with autism, but people with all different kinds of disabilities and identities. And the reason for that was because, like you said, they're a person first and then they are their diagnosis is just one aspect of who they are. Um, but actually, in more recent times, when um, autistic people were surveyed and asked what their views were about it, there was a general consensus that autistic person was the preference and the reason for that is that they felt that autism was part of their identity it was who they were and they were more than happy to be referred to as autistic person so i am trying to um move over into using that language because that is what the pop the, the community has asked for from services and from the media and when we're talking about the autistic population but it's quite difficult for us to unlearn those things and i think you know when it comes to language we can feel like we get a bit stuck and it almost feels like because i'm scared of using the wrong language i can't talk about this topic and i think that really does a disservice to the autistic population. So whether you say 
person with autism or autistic person ultimately it's about how you are communicating your message and if it is with respect and um openness then you're not going to go wrong um but you know if ever in doubt the best thing to do is speak to that person and ask them what their preferences are i'm sure they won't be offended and it will give you an opportunity to have a conversation with them about how they feel about those labels is that is that all right anthony no that's really really helpful and i think it's it, i think the fact we're having the conversation i think we our intent here is to have open conversation and i'm really happy for us to be um not challenged but just questioned about how we say things because actually we're all here to learn together the point of these webinars is that we're learning but they're open transparent uh, places and spaces for us to learn together so really happy for any feedback from anybody always about that great yeah um, it's yeah, really interesting question before was about reasonable adjustment sorry i just bumped yeah. over that one because i wanted to just deal with because i said it i wanted to address it yeah absolutely <laughs> so reasonable adjustment yeah, so we talked in the presentation about reasonable adjustments and that term kind of started being used in association with the Equality Act in 2010. Um, so we say that in law, services and organisations are required to make reasonable adjustments. And it's actually kind of intentionally vague um, because what is reasonable? You know, and, and there is arguments to be made about what is a reasonable level of adjustment. But when we're thinking about how we can make adaptations for the person with autism, I think the first major thing is have a conversation with that person. And if the person isn't able to explain to you what they need and what they find difficult, then speak to somebody who knows them well and get their advice about what might help that person. Because a really big theme in my presentation was just how diverse this population is. And there's often not a blanket statement that we can um, that we can apply to say that this one change is what's gonna make this situation accessible to this person. But the kind of things we might be thinking about, if you are part of a service that maybe has appointments, you could think about when you offer that appointment and how long the appointment is. So, for example, GP surgeries maybe will offer appointments for people with autism earlier in the morning so that there's not a lot of people in the waiting room. They'll make sure that the person doesn't have to wait because often waiting is, is a source of anxiety for the person with autism. Mm. And thirdly, they might need a little bit longer in that appointment. So they might be given a double appointment so that they can um, have the time to have their needs met without feeling rushed out the door. Um, so that's something that if you're offering appointments, that might be a useful thing to think about. The second thing you might want to think about is the environment. So thinking about sensory sensitivities, you're not going to go wrong if you try and make sure the environment is quiet, if you um, try and reduce visual distractions. So, you know, sitting in a, in a room, looking out a window that there's lots of people walking past or there's lots of cars going past is going to be quite visually distracting. It's going to make it harder for that person to focus on what they're doing. And even just like a busy wall of bulletins and leaflets can be quite visually distracting for a person with autism. So trying to keep the environment as low stimulation as you can, both in relation to sound and movement is always a good plan. Then you can think a little bit about the language that you're using. So a lot of the time people with autism will find it more difficult to take on verbal information. And this might be related to difficulties with language, which is associated with their autism, but it could also be to do with emotional regulation. So if they're in a situation where they're feeling quite overwhelmed and stressed, if they're doing something out of their routine, something that's making them feel nervous, just like for any of us, it's going to make it much more difficult to take in that verbal information. And I'm sure we've all been in that situation where you go and see a doctor or something and they give you loads of information and you nod along with it. And then you leave the room and you've forgotten everything they've said to you. And it's the same for people with autism. So thinking about how you communicate your information, try and simplify your language. It's not always an easy thing to do, but um, it's something that's really worth practicing. Secondly, check in with that person what they understand one of the things that we see quite often with people with autism is that they develop language slightly differently to the rest of the population so um, what can sometimes happen is that they learn language and they can repeat it back but they maybe don't have the same understanding that we have about the meaning of that language 
So the context for that is that when um, a child without autism is developing language, they will have to hear a word many, many times before they feel confident to use it. And they usually have a really strong understanding of that concept before they use the language. What we see with people with autism is sometimes they hear language and they repeat it when they don't have a really strong understanding of what that language means. And this is really important because sometimes people with autism can talk a lot about a subject, but when you ask them more questions about it, they find it hard to answer those questions. And that indicates that they don't have that fundamental understanding that they need to understand it. So the way that we can deal with that is not just by saying, have you understood that? Or even asking them to repeat it back to you but asking more questions about how they interpret that. So, well, OK, so what does that mean to you? What do you think would happen next if you did that? How do you think that would make you feel? And those kinds of questions will allow you to support that person to really think through the process. When we talked about understanding consequences and problem solving, um, it's really important that we work through that through the conversation. Don't assume these things, but actually have a really in-depth conversation with that person about their understanding. And you might just be able to take them from a place of using language they don't understand to using language in a way that they do understand and putting it into their own words, which is really, really important. So language is very important. How we use language and the questions we ask is very important. And then thirdly, think about how you can put that verbal information down on paper. So we know that a lot of people with autism might have a learning disability, they might have associated learning difficulties like reading and writing. So we need to really know what their written and writing and reading skills are. But once we do know that, we can put information down in writing in a way they understand. So it might be appropriate to include some pictures in there, um, you can, it's really um, much easier to simplify information when we're writing it down. So we can really um, condense it down into a few key statements. This is the medication you're on. This is what it's for. This is how many times you have to take it. Don't just rely on them being able to remember all that information or even that they're able to read the prescription because that often isn't the easiest thing for people to understand. So making information really clear and putting it down on paper. And that means when they leave, they'll be able to check back on it if they've not been able to take all that information in while you were there. So making things visual is going to be massive. And then the other thing to take into consideration is advocacy. So there are different advocacy organisations that people with autism can contact and have an advocate um, you know, given to them. Also, people often have advocates within their lives, whether it's a parent or a friend. And encouraging them to bring somebody along that they trust can be really supportive for that person with autism. If they're not able to express in that moment, I really need a break. I don't understand what you're saying to me. That advocate might be able to do that for them. Um, so I think that's that's a bit of a kind of a whistle stop of, of different um, reasonable adjustments that, that you could make if you were thinking about how to make things more accessible for that person. Um, was there anything we didn't cover um, in relation to situations that could be made more accessible for people with autism? We could so talk about interviews. No, so that's incredibly helpful, Kirsty. Thank you so much. Really, really helpful. Um, one other the questions come up in the chat, though, is a really current one, which about is about vaccine hesitancy and how we might think about having a tailored or bespoke conversation, which could be different for someone with autism than for other people around addressing their anxiety. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question, and it's probably something that's coming up quite a lot. Um, I think one of the really big things, like we would for anybody who's hesitant with the vaccine, is to understand what it is about it that is making them hesitant. So if it's a concern about the actual getting the injection, then there are things we can do to make that easier for that person with autism. So a lot of those reasonable adjustments that I talked about just then could be relevant. You know, having an earlier time in the morning when it's quiet, no waiting. Um, the other thing that might be necessary is to think about some desensitisation work. So if they're nervous about the environment, they could come a couple of times without getting the injection. They could have somebody really talk through what's going to happen and what it's going to be like. And that can be really helpful. If the concern is more about the purpose of the vaccine and um, maybe the, the consequences of it, 
then it might be more important to have a conversation about why the vaccine is happening. Um, and I, I would say that's possibly the more complex issue to talk about with somebody with autism. Because when we talked about thinking style, sometimes they can be quite rigid in their ideas about things and it may not be possible to convince them. But it's really important to lay out really clearly why the vaccine is being recommended, what the consequences might be for not having it. And don't assume any um, any prior knowledge. So really break it down as simple as you can into exactly why it's happening, who's organised it, and what will happen to them afterwards um, and give them time. So it might require a number of these conversations, drip feeding these ideas into the person for them to maybe come around to the idea. So um, that that is a really big challenge, but I think for a lot of people it can be overcome um, if you just approach them in the right way with the with the problem. That's really helpful and a really good place for us to end, Kirsty. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. So I'm just, we've had a lot of questions and I have promised people will pick up the questions either at subsequent webinars or through the Q&A panel at the end. So I, I will be uh, collecting them and collating them. Thank you so much, both Claire and Kirsty. Really informative, really helpful. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. So um, just to remind people our webinar this afternoon is through is lived experience uh, very much from a lived experience perspective and what it feels like to have autism. So please uh, join us for that. Thank you very much. Have a great day.